post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Look, Batty, you have a description of the killer, don't you? Yes, Scubby, and what a description. An average size man wearing a dark overcoat. Why, I can pick up a dozen suspects on every corner with that description. That's going to be tough, all right, Matty. Yeah. You don't know where the murdered man went last night. Don't know whom he was with. Don't even know where he was killed. Aren't there any clues at all, Nick? Just one, Scubby. And you're looking right at it. Yeah, a fine clue that is. A dead body with a knife in its back. And now, the case of the henpecked husband. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. <laughs> Professor Harold Thompson has never been inside a gambling house in all his 53 years. His wife wouldn't allow it. But since reading about the game of roulette in his encyclopedia, the professor is willing to risk Mrs. Thompson's anger because he has a wonderful plan. That's why he's come to Nick Carter. I shall win $20,000 each evening, Mr. Carter, and then cease my activities. Well, what do you want me to do? First, show me the establishments where this game is played. Second, ascertain whether the roulette wheel is honest. And third, see that I'm not uh, robbed of my winnings by some footpad. Well, Professor, what makes you so sure there will be any winnings? Well, from reading the article on roulette in my encyclopedia, I have evolved a system of wagering by which I can't possibly lose. Take my word for it, Professor. You can't possibly win. Not over any period of time. Oh, but you don't know my system. Here, uh, let me have a piece of paper. Believe me, Professor Thompson, no system will beat a roulette wheel. Ah, but it's quite simple to the mathematical mind. Hmm. Now, here we have... Oh, my fountain pen is dry. Excuse me. Nick Carter speaking. Sergeant Matheson, Nick. Oh, what's on your mind, Matty? How's about having dinner with me tonight? My wife's visiting her mother, and I hate eating alone. Why, sure, Matty. Good idea. Patsy's gone down to Cuba for a few days, so I'd probably be eating alone anyway. All right, then suppose you pick me up at my office about seven, huh? Will do. See you then. Okay. So long. I filled my pen from your inkwell, Mr. Carter. I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, of course not. Now, I have withdrawn $2,500 from my savings account, and I'm ready to begin operations. Do you want to help me or not? I do not. All I want to do is to keep you from throwing your money away. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. In that case, I shall proceed without you. Good day. Hey, Daisy, take a look at the little old guy at the roulette table. Hey, he's doing all right, isn't he? Yeah, he's doing too good. Hey, look, maybe I ought to go over and get acquainted, huh? Yeah, feed him a couple of drinks and keep him playing till the house gets those chips back. Mm -hmm. I don't want him leaving here with that kind of dough. Number four, black. Oh, there you are. Why, you lucky boy, you won again. But of course, I intended to. <laughs> I was standing right behind you. Maybe I brought your luck, huh? Today's my birthday, you know. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, you must give me your address so that I can send you some flowers. Flowers? Are you... Here, I, I brought you a drink. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. A cocktail? Oh, but I mustn't. My wife never allows me to take intoxicants. Oh, go on. It won't hurt you. Gee, you got a lot of chips there. Yes, my winnings amount to $22,000. Um, where can I exchange them for money? You don't mean you're quitting. Oh, I must. It's long after midnight. I don't know what my wife will say. Not leaving, are you? Well, you can't. Not when you're winning. Come on, be a sport. Well, since I have an extra $2,000, I shall wager it on uh, number 33. Hey, wait a minute. You can't bet two grand's on a number. 100's the limit. It's all right, Maxie. But, boss, the numbers pay 35 to 1. Who's running this place? Okay, okay, it's your funeral. Uh, that's all, that's all, no more bets. Thank you, Mr... Uh, Beal, Harry Beal. Mr. Beal, actually, I'm throwing away this $2,000. You see, I don't wish to win more than $20,000 tonight, and... Uh, number 33. Hey, you won again. My, how extremely fortunate. Yeah, 
Another 70 grand. Maxie, close it up. Everything. No more play tonight. Okay, boss. Hey, Harry, we've got 90,000 bucks coming. What are you going to do? I'm going to pay it. Uh, come on back to my office, sport. We'll have a few drinks to celebrate your good luck. Then I'll cash in your chips. <laughs> Imagine me winning all this money. Imagine. Oh, my. Oh, my. Come on. Oh come on, Palsy. You'll be all right when you get in the car. Oh, he's all right now, Maxie. Oh, but, but I should have been home long, long ago. Yeah, maybe you'd like to stop for another drink before you go home, huh, Prof? Oh, no, Miss Gilmore. No. I, I, I might become a bit uh, tipsy. And, and, and my wife... Yeah, uh, she don't like drinking, huh? My wife doesn't like anything. My wife doesn't like anybody. Except uh, her brother Wilfred, of course. He's been visiting us uh, for nine years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's the boss's car, Prof. This blue convertible. Pile in. Very well. Uh, I shall drive. Oh, no, no. I'm driving, chum. You sit in the middle. Oh. Okay. Oh, where do you live, Prof? Far, far away. In the suburbs. Eastview. Oh. Hey, Maxie, it's going to be too windy driving out there with the car all open like this. You better put the top up, hadn't you? Not the hell. Do them good. <laughs> I assure you that I am quite capable of driving. Hey, Prof, grab your hat. What did oh, you... Too late, it's gone. Oh, so it is. Well, if you will let no, me no, out... No, you sit still. I'll get it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let me... Prof, what are you doing? You don't want to get behind the wheel. Maxie's coming back. Oh, hey, no. hey, come back here. Prof, turn around. Go back for Maxie. Uh, Thompson never turns back. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with you? I, I, I was thinking of my wife. If she could see me now with you, Miss Gilmore, she'd murder me. Oh, doggone it. Sure, Miss Patsy. She's away. I only... Hiya, Nick. How's things? Why, hello, Scubby. Long time, no see. Been pretty busy, Nick, but the newspaper's hitting a new low just now. What? You mean there's no story worthy of the attention of a hotshot reporter like Scubby Wilson? Not a thing. That's why I dropped in to see if you had any hot tips. Oh, uh, not a thing, Scubby. Hey, where's Patsy? Oh, taking a little vacation in Cuba. And do I miss her? Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, do you want me to type that for you? Uh, no, thanks. Just about finished now. Hmm. But I, oh, excuse me. Nick Carter speaking. Morning, Nick. Mary. Oh, hi, Mary. Uh, you remember the little guy who wanted to play roulette? The one you told me about at dinner last night? Professor Thompson? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what about him? Well, I'm on my way out to his house in Eastview. I thought you'd like to come along. Uh, what's happened? The prof was found in a ditch north of the city about 8 o'clock this morning, Nick. Stabbed in the back. Uh, when did you see your husband last, Mrs. Thompson? He left immediately after dinner last night, and... Is your name Mrs. Thompson? Well, now, look here. Never mind, Wilfred, dear. I feel strong enough to talk now. Now, don't excite yourself, Anna. Remember your indigestion. All right, now, Mrs. Thompson... You know, I suffer the... terribly from nervous indigestion. Well, last night, when Harold wasn't home by midnight, I was so furious... So worried, Hannah. Yes, so worried that poor brother Wilfred had to get out of bed and phone the doctor. Mrs. Thompson, do you know where your husband went last night? I do not. Some den of iniquity, no doubt. What makes you say that? No respectable place would keep a man out after midnight. You're right, Hannah. When the doctor left at 1.30, I told brother to lock the front door and bolt it. Well, the medical examiner says Professor Thompson was killed at least an hour later than that. And we found him clear on the other side of town. Did you say he'd been robbed? That's right. His pockets were turned inside out. If his pockets were empty, Maddie, how did you identify the body so quickly? His initials were in his hat band, Scubby. And the inside pocket of his overcoat had been overlooked. His notebook and a letter were there. <laughs> I can't imagine why anyone would want to rob Harold. I never allowed him to carry more than $5 in cash. According to what he told Nick, Mrs. Thompson, he had just drawn $2,500 from the bank. Twenty... He wouldn't dare. Now, Hannah, don't excite yourself. And only last week he objected when I spent $50 to get brother a new suit. Well, my dear, you know Harold never liked me. 
Can't Wilfred buy his own clothes? Wilfred is temporarily out of employment. Mr. Carter, did my husband mention why he drew that money out of the bank? I think he intended to play roulette with it, Mrs. Thompson. That's what she was doing, gambling, throwing his money away and then getting himself killed. There's always the insurance, Hannah. Huh? Why, why, Wilfred, of course. Ten thousand dollars. And in a case like this, we'll be able to collect double indemnity, too. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mr. Carter? <sighs> You'll have to settle that with the insurance company. Twenty thousand dollars. Well, brother dear, I guess everything is all right after all. <laughs> Hey, Nick, where are we driving to? An address I found in the professor's notebook, apartment 9B, 176 Van Arnhem Street. But he had a couple of dozen addresses in that book. Why pick this one? Who lives there? I don't know, Matty. There wasn't any name. But the address was written in blue ink. What? And everything else in the notebook was in black ink. You think the blue ink means something, Nick? I do, Scubby. See, the professor filled his fountain pen in my office late yesterday afternoon with blue ink. Which oh. makes you think he wrote down this address after he met you, huh? It's the way I figure it. And there may be someone who was with him last night. Uh. Well, 176 should be in this block. Yeah, this building on the right is the only one that looks like an apartment house. Yeah. Now, I can't see the number, but there's a guy walking over here that ought to be able to tell us. Hey, you fellas sure made good time. Is this 176? Yeah, you're the police, ain't you? I am, but well, what... come on, and I'll take you up. Up where? We're looking for apartment 9B. Sure, I know. I'm the one that sent for you. What? You sent for the police? Yeah, I'm the superintendent of the apartment house. It was me that found the body. What body? Daisy Gilmore's, of course. Like I said over the phone, she'd been murdered. <laughs> And so the address in the dead professor's notebook had led not to a solution of the case as Nick hoped, but to another murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the henpecked husband. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As Nick examines the lifeless body of Daisy Gilmore, Matty questions the building superintendent of Daisy's apartment house. That's just the way she was when I found her about 15 minutes ago. I seen right away she was dead, so I called the cops. Yeah? And what business did you have in this apartment? Well, uh, I come in to clean up like I always do on Saturday afternoons. I get five bucks for it. Uh-huh. How long do you think she's been dead, Nick? At least eight or ten hours, Matty. She was stabbed, wasn't she? Just like the professor. Yeah. Yeah. Judging from the wound, I'd say it could have been the same knife. Yeah, then I'll bet he was killed here, too. It was inside someplace. Well, what makes you think that, Matty? Oh, I forgot you and Nick didn't see the body of the professor. No. Well, the knife didn't go through his overcoat. What? They put that on him after he was dead. Hey, no. hey, could Miss Gilmore have been killed at 4.30 this morning? Might have been done that long ago. Why? Well, I seen a guy coming down the stairs from this floor about 4.30. Or maybe it was closer to 5. You say he was coming down the stairs? Yeah. I thought it was funny he didn't take the elevator, and I bet that's why. I bet he just killed her, and he didn't want anybody to see him. Would you recognize the man if you saw him again? Oh, sure. He was about my size, and he wore a dark overcoat. That's a swell description. Well, Look, uh... you, what were you doing prowling around at 4.30 in the a.m.? Mr. Wagner on the floor below this couldn't find this key when he come home, see, so I had to get up and let him in. Look, do you know whether Miss Gilmore was acquainted with the professor? Thompson? No, but they might be able to tell you at the 60 Club where she was. The, the 60 Club? Hey, Nick, that's a gambling joint. Sure it is. It's Harry Beale's place. And the professor was going to play roulette last night. Sounds like a definite lead, Matty. Look, Nick, I don't want to leave here until the medical examiner and the fingerprint boys come. Maybe you'd like to go over and talk to Beale, huh? I certainly would. And right now, come on, Scubby. <laughs> Beal, what about it? I'm trying to find out whether a Professor Harold Thompson was in your club last night. Hey, Maxie, the guy wants to know if we saw the prof last night. Is he kidding? And you do remember him. I wish I could forget him. He cleaned out the joint. You mean the professor won? He took 90,000 bucks away from me, that's all. Oh, oh. And in cash. I'll be darned. That roulette system of his worked. Look, mister... There ain't any roulette system that works. The prof won in spite of his system. Yeah, that's what I get for running an honest wheel. Never again, believe me. And you say the professor had $90,000 in cash when he yeah, left here? Yeah, my cash. Not only that, he took my car and my girl. Daisy Gilmore? That's her. Oh, so maybe you were jealous, huh? Of the prof? 
Don't make me laugh. Look, if Daisy would have held the prop's hand even, he'd have fainted. How do you happen to take your car, Harry? I, I told Maxie here to drive him home to be sure he got there safe. Yeah, especially since he was slightly plastered. And Daisy was going along, so, so I thought this I... jerk lets him get away from him. What time did all this happen? Oh, about 2 a.m. What's your idea all the questions? It wasn't long after that that the professor was robbed and murdered. You mean somebody knocked him off? Yes, somebody who knew he had that money. You knew about it, Beale. And so did you, Maxie. Hey, what are you picking on us for? What about Daisy? She was with him. We weren't. Both of you knew that, too. Maybe you expected her to get the money away from him. Maybe that's why one of you was waiting at her apartment when she got home. Waiting with a knife. Huh? What did you say? You mean Daisy got her, too? She's dead? She sure is. And you two got a lot of explaining to do. Now, well, look, you can't pin anything on me. I was still here at the club at 4.30. I got a dozen witnesses. What makes you so sure Daisy wasn't killed after 4.30? Uh, well, I... Look here, Harry. The superintendent of her apartment building saw a man leaving between 4.30 and 5, and he says he'd recognize that man if he saw him again. Maybe you'd better come down to headquarters and let him take a look at you. I... All right. All right, so I was there. When I closed up the joint, I hopped a cab to Daisy's place. When I walked in, she was already dead. So that's your story, huh? Well, Harry, I think they'll want to hear that at headquarters, too. Hey, okay, okay, I'm not afraid to go down there. Maxie, get me my hat. Okay. Isn't that it on the desk there beside you? That gay 90s model? Yeah. <laughs> not much. Uh, that belongs to the prof. What's that? Sure. That's how he got away from me. His hat blew off, and when I got out of the car to get it for him, he drove off and left me. So that's what's happened. Come on, Scully. We got work to do. Hey, copper, I thought you was hauling me in. Haul yourself in, Harry. I'm going after the real killer. <laughs> Mrs. Thompson, did your husband own a car? Yes, but I didn't let him drive it. I always felt much safer with Brother Wilfred at the wheel. Where's the car now? Wilfred took it down to the Holloway garage to have the oil changed. Oh, he did, huh? Yes. I thought a drive might clear my head after that drug the doctor gave me. You've had the doctor again today? No. He gave me something awfully strong last night. He said, I'm going to give you enough of this so that we can both get some sleep. <laughs> he doesn't like being called out at night. Hmm. Just one more question, Mrs. Thompson. How many hats did the professor have? He had two. Why? Where are they now? Well, he was wearing one of them when he was killed. The other's on the hall tree, right? No, it isn't. Wait, it's gone. He uh, must have lost it. That beautiful three-dollar hat of all the never mind, never mind about that now. How do I get to the Holloway garage? <sighs> it's down the street about six blocks. You going to see my brother? Not only going to see your brother, Mrs. Thompson. I'm going to ask him some very pointed questions. <laughs> Look, Nick, you're not really sure that Wilfred killed the professor, are you? I'm positive, Scubby. Okay. But why? Well, the professor lost his hat at the 60 Club, and yet he was wearing his other hat when he was found dead. That proves he got home safely. But suppose he went out again. Oh, no, no, not him, Scubby. Not at 3 o'clock in the morning. Besides, the front door was locked and bolted. Mrs. Thompson was in a heavy sleep induced by a drug. So Wilfred must have let the professor into the house. Sure. After he killed him, he got the overcoat and the second hat off the hall tree put them on the body, and then drove to the other side of town and dumped it in the ditch. Sure. Thought he'd make it look like a holdup. You think Wilfred also knocked off Daisy? I'm sure of it. The wounds in both bodies were made by the same kind of knife. Probably one he got from the kitchen. Oh, but Nick, how could he know about We'll the... find out that out later. Here's the Holloway garage just ahead. Hey, did you notice that car that just came out of the garage, Nick? Yes, and brother Wilfred was driving it. His sister must have phoned ahead to warn him. Oh, I should have expected that. Now, oh, darn it. Hey, do you think that we can catch him? Unless that bus of his can make better than 90 miles an hour, I can. Hold on, Scubby. We're gaining on him. Yeah, it won't be long now. Oh, brother. Hey, you weren't kidding when you said hold on. Can't you even slow down on the curves? Not if I want to catch this guy. Well, take it easy. We're almost up to him now. Look, Scubby, I'm going to pull up alongside of him. If you want me to yell at him to no, pull no, over? No, no, it won't do any good. He knows what we want. Uh, sure, but... I'll Nick, have to force you... him over to the side of the road. Well, he's not slowing up any. Then I'll crowd him some more. Hey, Nick, look out! He's cutting into us. For the love of Pete, Nick, watch it! At 
high speed, the killer swerves his car directly into Nick's. And with a crash, both autos leave the highway. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the hen-pecked husband. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Driving at high speed, Nick Carter tried to stop an escaping killer by forcing his car to the side of the road. But the killer, realizing he's been trapped, smashed his car into Nick's. With a crash, both cars left the road. It's now a few moments later. Oh, brother. Oh, was that a narrow escape? Oh, you hurt, Scubby? I don't think so. Oh, my joints seem to work okay. Well, how about you? Uh, nothing serious, I guess. You know, for a minute there, I thought we were going to turn over. Darn lucky we didn't. Darn lucky I had good brakes. I managed to slow down a little before he hit us. Oh, come on. Holy cow. Look at Brother Wilford's car. There's our wreck for you. Uh huh. The way he's wrapped around that tree, it's a wonder if he's not dead. Try opening the door, Scubby. Okay. No, no soap. It's jammed, but good. In that case, we'll have to bust a window and haul him out that way. Look out, I'm going to heave this rock. Let her go. <laughs> well, well, listen to that. Brother Wilford's still alive, I'm glad to say. All right, give me a hand, Scubby, and we'll get him out. Yeah, sure thing, Nick. My head. Oh, skip it, Wilford. Save your strength. I'm dying. I'm dying. Yeah, and Maddie's just dying for a little conversation with you. Come on. Let's go down to headquarters. <laughs> What's the doctor say, Matty? No bones broken, plenty of bruises, and a possible concussion. We'll know in a minute, Nick. It's a wonder we're not all dead after what happened. Uh, you can come in, Sergeant. Doc says no concussion. You can talk to him if you want to. Brother, I sure do. Come on, Nick. You too, Scubby. Okay. I'd like to know what in heaven's name was the idea of chasing me and wrecking my car. Now, if you think you... Look, have... Wilford, instead of asking questions... Suppose you answer, sir. Well, I tell you... When I... the professor came home last night and told you that he'd won $90,000, you killed him, didn't you? Sergeant, that's ridiculous. No, it but... isn't, Wilfred. You unbolted the door and let the professor in when he came home last night. I've told then you Then you I... killed him with a knife you got from the kitchen. That's not true. Then you put the professor's hat and coat on the dead body and took it out in the suburbs and dumped it in a ditch. Now, where'd you hide the money? Carter, you can't prove a word of that. Oh, but we can, Wilfred. You can't even prove Harold came home after being at that gambling den. No. When the professor was found, he was wearing a hat that he had left in the hall rack in the hat in the hall rack of his home when he went out for the evening. Well, nevertheless, I... You didn't know that he left the hat he was wearing at the club, did you? He left his hat at the... He did. And with Mrs. Thompson asleep under the influence of the opiate, you were the only one who could have let him in because the door was bolted. All right. I did kill him. The old tight wad. Come on, Wilfred. Where's the money? In a shoebox in my closet. Uh, look, how did you find out about Daisy? I... Uh, I saw her sitting in the car when I let Harold in. And knowing she could swear that he got home safely, you had to get rid of her. Well, I... So you asked the prof about her, and he told you everything. He even gave you her address, which he'd written down in his notebook. All right, if you know everything, why ask me? We'd just like you to hear you tell it, that's all. So long for now, brother. We'll have a confession ready for you to sign in a little while. Oh, Nick, do you still have that notebook, the one with the professor's roulette system in it? Sure yeah. I do, Scabby. Why? Well, I was just thinking I'd sort of like to copy down the system he figured out to beat the game. Scubby, are you nuts? No. If he could win 90 grand with it, why? I don't see why Scubby, I can't Scubby. possibly... You ought to know better. Whatever the professor won, he won in spite of his system, not because of it. Oh, yeah, sure, Nick. You're right. But I'll bet I can write a swell story on it for the Sunday paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Ed Latimer plays Matty. John Kane is Scubby. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Friends, Despite the progress made in the treatment of cancer, we can't let up in our fight to stamp out this dreaded killer. 
Yes, every three minutes, someone dies of cancer. And the fight against it can be carried out only with your help. So give and give generously to the American Cancer Society. Give more than before. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser.